Cybono Discovery Center, South Africa's flagship science center and the largest in Southern Africa, has welcomed more than one million visitors through its doors since opening in Gauteng. In 2015, it was named as one of the 20 best museums in Africa and the recipient of numerous other awards. Its collection of more than 350 permanent interactive exhibits is constantly growing, while the center also plays host to international exhibitions. A number of other programs and public talks give the general public an unequaled opportunity to engage with and learn more about science. Despite being one of the most popular leisure destinations in South Africa, Saibono is also one of the largest science and math NGOs in the country. As one of the support entities of the Gauteng Department of Education, it plays a pivotal part in ensuring quality education for every child in Gauteng, especially in the STEM field. In addition to a large number of interactive exhibits and programs, the center also boasts state-of-the-art chemistry, mechatronics, life sciences and ICT labs, facilities very few schools or children from disadvantaged communities have access to. Saibono manages many large-scale projects throughout the province, offering school support, teacher development as well as ICT training. A full-service career centre is staffed by experienced psychometrists, counsellors and educational psychologists to assist learners to make informed decisions about possible career paths. The many awards and success stories attest to Saibono's commitment and ability to improve the quality of education in Gauteng. Our success is a direct result of the support we receive. To find out more, visit www.saibono.com. Good afternoon, or if you are joining us from another time zone, good morning or good evening. Uh, I am joining you here from the fantastic Cy Bono Center in downtown, downtown Johannesburg. And uh, we also have a lovely live audience of uh, future scientists from Waverly Girls High here with us today. Um, while we are enjoying, uh, enjoying late summer here in South Africa, um, some of our Finnish guests, I think, are finding themselves in a snow white winter wonderland. Um, but today we are all entering the wonderful wonderland of science, technology, engineering and mathematics, or STEM for short. We still have some people uh, joining us here in the cloud. So in the meantime, I'm going to handle a few uh, um, housekeeping things. Um, so the first thing is we have excellent experts in our panel today and also in our audience have unique experiences and unique insights that nobody else um, has. So we would love you to also share those with us. And there are two main ways that you can do that today. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there is a chat box and um, please chat with us. You can chat to the panelists and you can chat to, to everybody else um, on, the, on the webinar. Um, so please use that for comments in general. And then there's also that Q and A box. Now that is specifically for, for questions. Um, and you can direct your questions to specific panelists or just, just in general. Another cool thing about the Q and A is that you can, can choose other questions that you like and upvote them. So if you see that somebody asked a question that, that you also want to ask, you can upvote that one. And obviously, the more votes a question get, the more priority um, it will get by the panelists. Um, and uh, then also, if you, if you see a question and you want to comment on that, you can also do that. So that's another cool thing that you can do. Um, Another thing that we would love you to do is to share your experiences on social media as we go through this journey and program together. And you can use the hashtag Girls Love STEM. Um, you will also see that there in the chat box, um, we have shared the, 
the different social media handles of both Saibono and the Embassy of Finland. And so please interact on those pages as well. Now, um, we have some very important and some very interesting people in the webinar. The most important person is you, um, but we also have some dignitaries. And I want to acknowledge uh, right in the beginning, the Finnish ambassador to South Africa, Ms. Anne Lamila, and uh, also the CEO of Saibono, Dr. More Chakane. And uh, we look forward to hearing from them in a minute or so. Um, just a quick overview of the program before we start. Um, the first part of the webinar, we will have our dignitaries say something at first. Then we are going to have two experts from Finland and four from South Africa, who is going to share a short presentation. And then after that, we are going to have 20 minutes of panel discussion. And uh, so if you have any questions, you can start typing your burning questions there. Some of them will be answered directly on the uh, Q&A box. And hopefully some of them we can also get to in the, in the panel discussion. So don't sit back and relax. Please interact, engage as we get the ball rolling. So it's a great privilege for me to introduce to you the Finnish ambassador to South Africa, Anna Lamila, who has lived and worked in different parts of the world. Um, she in included in all her many ambas ambassadorial posts was also one as ambassador at large for global women's issues and gender equality. So without further ado, Ambas Ambassador Lamila. Uh, thank you very much and good day to everybody. And I would like to welcome you to this very high level expert event on girls and women in science. Uh, the event is most timely as in February, we celebrate uh, the Global Day of Women and Girls in Science around the world. I would like to extend my very special welcome to learners from uh, Waverly Girls High School. You are our guests of honor today, and I hope that, that this event will inspire you to race to your full potential in your future career. My embassy is also immensely grateful for our co-host, Skybono Discovery Center, the largest science center in the Southern Hemisphere. Thank you all for the hard work you have done to make this uh, event happen. Recent years, the global community has made a lot of efforts in inspiring and engaging women and girls in science. Yet women and girls continue to, to be excluded from participating fully. Longstanding biases and gender stereotypes are steering girls and women away from science related fields. At present, less than 30% of researchers worldwide are women. Furthermore, according to recent UNESCO study, only around 30% of all female students elect STEM-related fields in higher education. Globally, female students' enrollment is particularly low in uh, ICT, 3%, natural science, mathematics, and statistics, only 5%, and in engineering, manufacturing, and construction, 8%. Dear participants, one of the key factors behind the success of my country, Finland, is equal access to quality education. The Finnish success story would not have been possible without full and equal inclusion of both girls and boys in our education system. All Finnish girls and boys study free of charge and in mixed classrooms until they turn 18 years old. We do, have, we do not have separate boys and girls schools like Waverly Girls High, but uh, I have to tell you that I, I, I did go to a girls uh, high school and uh, that, wasn't, uh, that was quite a nice experience also, but nowadays we don't have them anymore. So Finland has an excellent track record in gender equality. My country has been ranked world's second best country for girls, 
Furthermore, uh, third in the world, what comes to, uh, to global gender gap reports. So we have uh, not so many, many gaps between women and, and men. So I like to believe that this is of course due to our many talented young girls, but also thanks to systematic and consistent investment in policies that actively promote equal opportunities for all citizens, regardless of their gender. In the latest education performance study, PISA, 15-year-old Finnish female student were on, the, on top of the world and outperformed male students. This applies to all categories assessed, uh, uh, assessed such as reading, mathematics, and science. However, when it comes to girls choosing science as a study or subject or career, we start seeing clear differences between girls and boys. Overall, 55% of all university degree are completed by women. However, 50 degrees in natural sciences are completed by women, but in technology and engineering, women only count 28% of all degree students and even less in ICT, 25%. These are still high numbers globally, but also show that other factor, factors than talent and opportunities define the career choice. According to the European Statistics Bureau Eurostat in 2018, less than one third of scientists and engineers were women in Finland, 29%. Finland is low in the ranking, which is led by uh, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and Latvia. And we are even below the European average, 41. So nothing to brag about. Girls can do it, but something prevents them to choose science, science as a career. I'm sure today uh, we will hear from our excellent panelists which factors and hidden biases are behind these bleak statistics. I also look forward to learning about the situation in South Africa, where many educational challenges still persist, but which also produces excellent female scientists as our lineup today shows. So let us get down to business and kickstart our webinar today. Once again, welcome, enjoy, and learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Ambassador Lamila. That was fantastic and a great cooperation between South Africa and Finland. Um, next on our list is uh, Dr. More Chakane. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Cybono and has a list of qualifications too long to cover um, all the way from science education to law. So I'm very excited to give the stage to Dr. Mori Chakar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Albertas. I hope that you can hear me. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon to all the participants in this webinar. First of all, I would like to Welcome the ambassador from Finland, Ambassador Adi Lamila. It is an honor, Ambassador, for us as Saibono here in Johannesburg to partner with Finland Embassy South Africa. That's a really an honor. And thank you so much with your team for giving us the opportunity. But also let me welcome our extinct women scientists that are going to share their experiences today, Professor Maija Axela, Il Helsinki University, Professor Kwaraisha Abdul Karim from Caprisa, Professor Rifirwe Pasanwa Mafuya from our University of Johannesburg here, Jenny Fertanen from the University of Tampere, and Ms. Ndoni Mkuni. She is the founder and CEO of Black Women in Science. And lastly, but not least, Ms. Judy Sandrock from FEMSTEM. 
Let me make some few remarks before I give over to Albertus. First of all, this month is the month of February, which is the month of the United Nations International Day of Women and Girls in Science. For us in Saibono as a science center, of course, this means a lot. And that is why we have partnered with Finnish Embassy to ensure and encourage that our girls enter the careers in STEM. And that is why we have also lined up this distinguished list of women scientists, which I have no doubt that they will inspire our girls that are also joining us here. I also want to welcome the girls from Way Valley High School. I really hope that uh, you're gonna enjoy, learn, and you'll be inspired to come and join the careers in science. If there's anything that has not made us aware that science is at the pillar of our lives because of the COVID-19 coronavirus, then we're not sure what next to do. If you look at coronavirus pandemic, the whole world came to a stop and everyone else was waiting for the scientists to make a breakthrough and discover and understand this virus and also come up with the vaccine. That in itself must show you my little girls that indeed science is very important in our lives. And I trust and hope you'll take up this challenge and be our future scientists, whereby next time also us here in South Africa will be able to innovate and produce our own vaccines for these pandemics. But let me also quickly share with you our history as Saibono in participation as far as women in science is concerned. All the way from 2006, we in Saibono have always been hosting and promoting STEM amongst women and girls. And to date, ambassador and participants in this webinar, I am proud to announce that we have touched not less than 9,000 750 girls that we have introduced STEM. And this we do all the time annually by inviting girls to Saibono, taking them through some of our psychological center and also going, of course, in the outreach communities. So we have been doing this work for some time and I'm proud that when we partnered with Finnish, we could quickly identify this common interest. Without wasting any time, Albertas, let me therefore wish everyone a fruitful and effective participation. I am sure we're gonna get uh, exciting questions that are relevant, that will help us and move forward as a science community. Thank you once more and welcome to everyone. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chakani. Um, I also just want to say that if you haven't been to the Saibono Center yet, um, you must definitely make a make a um, yeah make that a priority to to get here when that is possible. Um, our next person on our list, our first of the panelists, is Professor Maya Axela. She's a professor of science education at the University of Helsinki, Finland's capital, and amongst many other leadership positions. She is the director of the National Luma Centers in Finland that inspires children and young people to enter the wonderful world of mathematics, science, and technology. But I will let her tell us more. Professor Axela. Good afternoon. Hyvää iltapäivää in Finnish. It's my pleasure and honor to talk about how to inspire and engage future makers, women and girls in science. Thank you for your kind invitation. Kiitos. As we all know, there are a lot of challenges in the world to solve. We need all you future makers. Science opens opportunities for making a better world and sustainable future. In our LUMA STEM model in Finland, 
you future makers are in our hearts. We try to try to promote gender equality and try to find out new solutions together with you. As we know, we still need more girls and women to easily access in science and technology. Today, it's my pleasure to uh, share about the situation in Finland and what are we doing, especially in our LUMA program. This photo is uh, from a northern part of Finland, Lapland. It's very sunny days and beautiful in Finland just now. And if you like to know more about Finland, please visit our webpage, Visit Finland. As you heard from our ambassador, we have quite good situation. If we compare to other countries, OEC countries, in uh, reading literacy, mathematical literacy, and science literacy. But still, I, our challenge is that how to promote uh, girls to study math and science and careers in, in sci science. Also, the situation is uh, quite good compared to other countries, how do girls uh, choose science and technology and ICT, but there are still a lot of work to do. Uh, luckily, uh, we have quite good situ situation in our science teachers. About 60% of them are women. Also, last years, more and more girls are choosing uh, mathematics and science and uh, maybe one explanation is that they are giving more points when you are applying to university in finland we trust on collaboration we think that collaboration is key for success and in our luma model we try to catalyze collaboration between universities and teachers, children, families, parents, grandparents, and also other organizations, especially business sector. And we think that international collaboration is key for success. It's a pleasure to collaborate with you and also learn from you. Our teachers are very skillful and talented. And uh, all our teachers do master's degree in, in math and science at secondary level. And we have built uh, this kind of new, new models for teacher education, where formal, non-formal and informal learning has integrated. And it has been very successful. We have built the 11 university network called Luma Center Finland and I'm a director of it. And uh, we just published a new book in English. It's free of cost, and you can find out about 100 uh, stories how we promote math and science education. Also, if you are keen on about how we integrate teacher education to science education at universities, there is one ebook about it. We try to promote scientific literacy. We have built a new program, Natural Sciences Now and in Future program. We try to show also girls solutions and careers and uh, what is the science now and what are the opportunities in future. We have built 16 LUMA labs to different universities where uh, future makers can meet scientists and make uh, exciting activities. And it's uh, also often part of teacher education. We have found that it's important the collaboration with business so that girls get uh, role models and, and uh, support for, for good future. We have a lot of good LUMA activities and uh, openings, but we are also researching what, how they interest them and what are the best solutions. 
So we always say that we are like a learning community. We all are learning from each other. We are also learning from girls and women. We have built uh, this kind of international programs to you future makers to, to learn from each other and share your ideas and, and best things. Welcome to participate on SARTI program. Especially family science education is, is important for us. We try to find out how uh, mothers and grandmothers and girls can, can study together and, and learn about science and mathematics. We have built uh, Chow Science Clubs with Santa uh, organization, also e-clubs. And uh, that's one exciting uh, program going on. It's like a STEAM program. And we try to promote how to catalyze science at home also. And we have built uh, different kind of forms also, also using newest research. So if you like to know more about what are we doing in Finland, we have international Luma news. And uh, there is, for example, next summer, we have a teachers climate change forum online. It's free of cost. You are welcome. And we have global challenges science camp for youth online. And it's also free of charge. So you are, you are welcome on participate on it. So you future makers are in our hearts. Together we are more. Thank you. Professor Axela, thank you so much. Um, I had the privilege of uh, visiting Finland and seeing some of the <laughs> wonderful schools that you are talking about. And uh, yeah, really, really impressive. Thank, thank you. you so much. So we are moving along. Our next uh, panelist is Professor Kairaisha Abdul Karim, who is an infectious diseases epidemiologist and associate Sci scientific director of CAPRISA. And that is the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa. She's an A-rated scientist with a long list of awards behind her name. And it's a real privilege for me to welcome Professor Abdul Karim to our virtual stage. Over to you. Thank you very much, Albertus, for that warm introduction, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, and I love this new phrase, future makers. <laughs> Greetings. Um, it's a great honor and privilege for me to be part of this distinguished panel and have the opportunity uh, to share with you uh, the UN International Day for Women and Girls. And I was given a long list of things that I should try and address in the eight minutes allocated to me. Uh, about my career, some obstacles, what impact my work has had and why we need women in science. And I thought I'm gonna try this little experiment here, which is um, the equivalent like, of a speed date, which is how am I using science to address gender inequities and uh, take you very rapidly uh, through more than three decades of my research on preventing HIV in young women. And I want to thank the, both the Finnish Embassy and Sai Bono um, Discovery Center for putting this uh, program together and having all of us um, here with the opportunity to talk to you. Um, okay, I seem to have a problem. Okay, there we go. Now, before I do anything, I just want to remind you of a few more things that uh, Maya just uh, highlighted and to elaborate that knowledge is power, but don't forget that science is fun and it starts with curiosity. We've heard in Finland an example of a knowledge-based economy, how everyone benefits and enjoys a better quality and standard of life. And science is important for transformation, and we know that uh, no way better than in Africa. But in Africa, typically, we imbibe new knowledge. So if there's a vaccine, we import it, we benefit from it. And we do very little for producing new knowledge. And I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, highlighted for us the challenges of dependency 
and that uh, we're seeing the results of that in being last in line for vaccines. And uh, earlier on, we saw other shortages in terms of laboratory tests, et cetera, that needed to be completed so that we can do the diagnostic testing. So um, I think it's uh, clear just with a few examples that there's a critical need for African-led solutions and that in finding African-led solutions, it doesn't mean that we have to compromise on excellence uh, in any way. And we need to start moving from our contributions uh, towards data from large clinical trials or other studies and specimen collection to actually leading the research, taking on some of the priorities that face Africa. But like Maya, I also want to highlight that as a global community, we live because and, and survive because of interdependence. And partnerships are important and critical. And in COVID, again, we know that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I'm so pleased uh, in some ways that um, all of you having been through the COVID uh, pandemic and being part of it and, and seeing what it means this past year um, uh, saves me from having to spend time explaining what epidemics and pandemics are. But we know that when you have a pandemic that every infection needs to be stopped. And one infection anyway means that none of us are safe. But I also wanted to touch on a unique characteristic of Africa, namely that we have 65% of our population is under the age of 35. And this is what we also refer to as the demographic dividend. And it's an asset that we need to treasure and nurture. There are many, many challenges to do cutting edge, groundbreaking science um, in Africa, many opportunities, the begging for solutions. And that I think even as we take on local questions and challenges, it's also of global importance. And I'm gonna switch now to focus on HIV as another pandemic. And uh, just a quick reminder, seeing that we have so much of COVID on our mind, that we have multiple pandemics in Africa running in parallel, including uh, TB and malaria. And I'm gonna focus on HIV in the limited time that I have. In 2019 alone, globally, there were 38 million people living with HIV, about 700,000 deaths. Now, this is because we now have antiretrovirals. So patients with AIDS on this triple drug regimen have had their lives transformed from something that was inevitably fatal to one that is chronic and manageable. But one challenge remains, which is how do we prevent new infections? In 2019, we saw 1.7 million new infections, which translates roughly to about four and a half, just over four and a half thousand new infections each day. And when you take that number, about 70% of those infections are in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 25% in young women between the ages of 15 to 24, and one in five infections in South Africa. South Africa with less than 1% of the population bears this disproportionate 20% of the global burden of infection. Now I've put a lot of details in my slide, but for those of you who don't read as fast as I talk, then you can just read the titles because that's the punchline. And I put in because I know we may have a mixed audience joining us virtually. Some of the data is in the slides, but a key thing that started me on this three decade journey was I had just finished my master's at Columbia University and returned to South Africa and said, what should I focus on? And in New York, I'd been surrounded by AIDS. Came, come to South Africa and there's very little data. So I undertake one of the earliest community-based surveys to quantify the problem and characterize it. In this study of about 5,000 people, I find that, that the red line being data in women and blue in men, that something very striking, up to age 10 to 14, no difference between boys and girls. Age 15 to 19, you see the blue line is still at the bottom, but you see the red line, six times more infection in young women already, peaking at age 20 to 24 in women. We only see peak in men around 25 to 29. This age sex difference in when women acquire infection compared to men is a key driver 
of the pandemic and the generalized hyperendemic epidemic that we see in Eastern and Southern Africa, characterized by a very high HIV prevalence, number of people infected, and at the same time continued new infections. So that was in 1990. I want to share with you data from 2020, and these are in kids who are in grades 9 and 10 in high schools in one of the districts in KwaZulu-Natal. So it included 14 schools. And what you see that the picture has not changed too much, that HIV is rare in boys between 15 to 20. But when you look at women already by age 15, 2.6%, steadily increasing by age 19, you're seeing just over one in 10 women infected. These are kids in school, I'll have you know, and one in five by age 20. So this is really important because what is happening is already as girls enter high school, we're starting to see them being decimated and following different trajectories compared to their male peers. Girls fall pregnant, they drop out of school, they get caught up in vicious cycles of dependency on men, usually older men. And these are the issues that determine how a woman will progress and need to be addressed to protect that demographic dividend and ensure that every person born in Africa has an equal opportunity to contribute. Here I'm sharing data from 2016 population-based survey, and you see again red line infections in women, blue in, in uh, boys and men, and here again what you see by age 25, every other woman infected with HIV, by age 30 the prevalence is 70%. And we go to 11 health districts in this province of KwaZulu-Natal, where I'm based and work in, more than 40% of pregnant women are also infected with HIV. In 2016, we were able to use more modern technologies, sequencing of virus, and we were able to generate the schematic that shows unequivocally that young women under the age of 25 are getting infected from men 25 to 40. These men, only one in five knew their status. Many had high viral loads, which uh, enhances and, so, uh, and facilitates transmission of HIV. They in turn are getting infected and infecting women 25 to 40. So if men 25 to 40 only had sex with women 25 to 40, we would have seen an end of this epidemic a long time ago. But the fact that we have young women and this ongoing and open cohort of young women coming in getting infected is what is driving it. And we have to break, break this uh, transmission link in order to impact the epidemic trajectory. By now, you have a good sense of the magnitude of the problem. And uh, now let's look at what do we have to prevent infection. Every one of the options we have, abstinence, behavior change, condom, circumcision, are all dependent on male cooperation. And the question many women were asking me at that stage already in 1990 is why can't you come up with a prevention tool for me? And this was a gap that we were, many of us were starting to recognize. And what you see here is the long road of knowledge generation that needs a lot of persistence and perseverance, many failures along the way. Eventually, in 2003, we decided, okay, leave the stuff that's on the shelf, uh, vaginal contraceptives there for other purposes, let's focus on something else. And this was ARVs, and we designed Caprisa 004 and uh, presented the data seven years later in 2010. It was a new prevention strategy for women, also referred to as pre-exposure prophylaxis. The prevention field was so parlous at that time that the top journal in science, Science and uh, Lancet ranked the study one of the top breakthroughs of that year. And what we found was that tenofovir prevents infection in women, offering 40% protection overall and 74% if tenofovir levels were high. And I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Now there's nothing like success to breed success. And uh, now what I show you is a whole range of products. And another way to look at it like this is those ARVs and biologicals that are being developed 
is the face of future phase of prevention technologies and including pet tablets, injectables, implants, rings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, including multi-purpose technologies. Many of them are in development. Vaccines, for example, are still not available. So there's still lots to be done. But I want to focus a little bit about biology because it's more than behavior. And what we found in trying to understand why we didn't do better was that pre-existing genital inflammation increases HIV infection. Not only does it increase um, infection, it also reduces the potency of tenofovir gel. And what we're trying to do now is understand what are the factors contributing to this occurrence of inflammation. And one of them is about the normal bacteria going into imbalance. Why is that? What are the factors contributing? And I don't have time to go through this exciting little piece, but just to say that reducing HIV rates in young women in Africa is critical. And that many things, the root cause of their vulnerability is about gender power disparities. And technologies are only the first step of addressing a fundamental social challenge. We know that age disparate sexual partnering is a key factor driving high rates and the biological factors of dysbiosis and inflammation. We've made a good start with pre-exposure prophylaxis, but we need to do better with less user dependent uh, technologies. I wanna thank many, many partners that we have uh, around the world. And I represent this data on behalf of over 200 scientists and students. And I think a few may be there, but I wanted to end with this, which is that, and it's a bit of a quote from Pope Francis. This is a moment to dream big, to rethink our priorities, what we value, what we want, what we seek, and to commit to act in our daily life on what we have dreamed of. For young girls, it is your time to shine and seize the opportunities for change and make a difference. So remember the mantra, nothing for us without us. So go out there and shine as bright as you can. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, yes, go out there and shine. Our uh, next panelist is uh, Professor Refilwe Paswana Mafuya. She's Professor of uh, Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Johannesburg. And she's also a distinguished scientist with accolades and positions that are very, very impressive. We are really excited to listen to you, Professor Paswana Mafuya. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And I must appreciate uh, Professor uh, Abdul Karun uh, for the wonderful overview she has given about uh, the epidemiology of HIV. I almost preempted that she will do a fabulous job. And I therefore have decided to rather share a more, uh, in a more personalized way how my journey has been. And this uh, is derived from the book that we have just recently announced and we, we hope to launch uh, very, very soon. Um, um, so my talk is on how did I uh, come all the way from a rural village uh, uh, to, be, to becoming an award-winning fighter of pandemics. And I'll run through my slides because it's difficult to give an overview of one's journey over a limited period of time. It's, it, I call it scientific in itself. Um, so in, in, in this book, just in a nutshell, uh, we are giving back to society, you know, that has built me and, and, and many others what it deserves. And I demonstrate how I hustled for my vision, pulled and pushed uh, towards it against all odds, how I overcame the village girl excuse that was in me and how I have been a beneficiary of generosity. And if you forget anything about what I'm gonna say, please remember this, uh, unparalleled supports and opportunities that uh, young people, young women receive are very critical in making them succeed in their careers. And in this book, uh, I, I talk about black women excellence and resilience. I share 
vulnerabilities, subtleties, peculiarities that women go through, uh, and the book device, you know, biases, prejudices, you know, that actually women can, uh, black women can, and women broadly can. So I have sort of extracted throughout my presentation some of the excerpts from, from this book. Um, my schooling years were difficult and impossible, but the love of my parents and the values they instilled in me carried me through. And uh, the rest, I don't have time to go through, but I have put it on a slide, which I believe will be made available. And uh, I just want to read a few lines uh, when I did uh, in the spotlight interview at SAFM. Uh, the summary of, of what I said was put, is put out in, on their website, which says, Prof. Paswana Mafuya comes from a, a humble family raised by self-employed, uh, uh, semi-literate parents in Limpopo, being one of the seven uh, children. Her career path was not easy, not straightforward. It was a winding road full of many, many uncertainties and failures and so on. That's my background. And I almost didn't make it to university due to resource uh, constraint, constraints. And to this day, I wonder what would have happened if someone had not taken a chance with me. I wonder what would happen if our society can take every black girl under their wing and give them support and unlimited opportunities and see if they cannot step into those opportunities and become the best that they can be and do the best that they can do. Um, my, my first like really eye-opening uh, event was when I got the AB Bailey Travel Bazaar to go to the UK. It was my first time to fly. The, the, uh, I, I missed some of the connections. I didn't know how things work and whatnot. But in this trip, I realized that I'm actually an ambassador for my country. I realized how big the world was and it really intrigued my uh, interest in pursuing uh, uh, science even more broadly because I went to uh, 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 um, Cambridge University, Oxford and London universities. They were huge, huge, huge buildings. And really it's amazing what one, how one really got inspired. Uh, pursuing a, a career as an epidemiologist has been one of the sharpest caps in, in my career life, but my vision really came to reality because indeed, as uh, uh, Prof. Karusha mentioned, uh, you've got to, 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 there's a lot of resilience, uh, perseverance. So you've got to, to have the love of what you are going for. And I must say that I, I, I truly felt, so uh, I was made to believe that the future of science depends on me. I mean, the support from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, from the Africa London Nagasaki, where I was five out of 480 applicants from 26 African countries that were given this uh, fellowship in order to be trained as an epidemiologist. And the Wellcome Trust gave a, 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 a ring fenced amount for me to be exposed to international institutions of consequence, like I've listed there. I mean, it was my dream of really contributing to new ideas, new technologies, innovations, and approaches, and to generate verifiable, quantifiable, measurable, replicable information that can help in uh, controlling epidemics and for the betterment of my society you know, was realized. And by so saying, I do not mean I have stopped. I mean, learning is a lifelong process and we are in the pandemic now and I'm in it as well. So um, really, really, I my eagerness was to drive the generation of robust epidemiological and public health evidence. And Prof. Karusha has clearly painted a picture on HIV. I will, uh, I will but may I emphasize the fact that uh, we've got marginalized communities that are disproportionately affected and impacted by HIV due to stigmatizing and discriminating conditions, appalling disparities that continue to persist in our country, barriers to healthcare and healthcare access, and really the, 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 the drive for every public health scientist, for every epidemiologist is to uh, generate evidence that will lead to greater availability, accessibility, and affordability of healthcare services so that people don't die, uh, 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 you know, uh, people should, should, lives should be preserved and people shouldn't die uh, out of 
uh, situations that could have been prevented. I just highlight here some of the studies that uh, I have uh, completed. And as you can see, with each study, there's a team of very capable people and there are several institutions involved. It is never a one, one man's show, really alone, I could never have done it. So this study is, was about comprehensive HIV prevention package for a high risk population, the men who have sex with men, who, who, whom we know uh, uh, how, uh, like in terms of HIV transmission and, and, and in terms of acquiring HIV, how much at risk they are. And I worked with Johns Hopkins University, Emory University and the University of Cape Town and so on. Uh, and uh, also study or, or to enhance efforts to get infants and children in prevention of mother child ma prevention of mother to child care transmission of HIV and healthcare programs in Port Elizabeth. Again, you see a team, you will see funding that was received, and you will see institutions that were involved. Key population implementation science study with a huge team again, integrated by behavioral surveillance in Ghana, uh, together with uh, the locals as collaborators, because it has always been collaborative work and, and integrated by behavioral surveillance in a survey in Port Elizabeth. And one of the intriguing studies that I did involved 10 countries where I went to East, West and South. Wow, in itself was quite a learning curve. Uh, my career success group, what is it? I'm sure you already know by now because you, as you, you've seen uh, the nature of teams I've worked in. Support system, support system, support system, a conducive work environment, uh, support by top cast of scientists, uh, funding support, uh, bias and stereotypes, they are very much there, very, very much there. Uh, the ambassador alluded to them. Uh, I have been the only native uh, 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 black uh, South African in, in, in some positions. I've been the first one and all that. Uh, so this has, uh, has, has, I've learned a lot and I've seen a lot. Uh, and really we, we have a lot to do in that regard. Women have a big place in science. Uh, uh, and and I've, I've, because of my history and how I have been from support of others, I took it upon myself to develop a, 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 a cadre of, of, of you know, future scientists. I've got over uh, 15 mentees and here I'm just showcasing three and one of them being my daughter uh, uh, who is in, in, in the construction industry. Uh, I'm saying girls can do science Winning the NSTF award has been one of uh, really uh, uh, humbling, humbling uh, um, gesture that has energized me because those who know it's a highly prestigious award uh, in recognition of the work that I have done over the past 15 years. Uh, um, I led the ninth SA AIDS conference in 2019, again handing uh, uh, to the deputy president what South Africa is saying about political commitment and about complacency, uh, uh, which must be driven out because we want to end the epidemic by 2030. I've had the privilege of speaking quite extensively on uh, COVID-19 in various radio platforms through the support of the NSTF uh, speaking in local languages so that we do not leave our communities behind. And here are just a few examples because I've had about six to seven of those radio interviews. And through the NSTF also, I've uh, engaged uh, youngsters, uh, uh, high school uh, uh, learners on choosing careers in science. What a time, what a time. I wish that was my everyday job. I wonder why South Africa does not have a science ambassador because I noticed other countries do have. It is so absolutely necessary. When young people see someone they see themselves in, really it ignites that passion and it makes them realize that it is actually possible. Uh, and also in my melody schools, meeting six schools, I never wanted to go back home. What a pleasure it was. And I believe that some of those young girls are busy preparing themselves for a career in science. Um, and last but not least, uh, speaking to young scientists at the South African Young Scientists Association, you know, that night, <laughs> they wouldn't let me go home. Like almost each one of them coming 
wanting, they, they just could not believe that a person like me who comes from a village could have gone this far. And so it really inspired them. Uh, so uh, I've, I've enjoyed the general media coverage on the work that we do with the rest of my uh, national and international collaborators. And thank you very much. Professor, thank you so much. Um, it is amazing to listen to all these inspiring role models. So if you are inspired, please uh, type there in the chat um, a wow or a heart or something um, just to share the, the inspiration that we're getting from these wonderful speakers. Thank you so much. Next in line is uh, Professor Jenny Vartiainen. She's a research and university lecturer of science education at the University of Tampere. And um, that's a city about two hours drive north of Helsinki in Finland. Uh, she's one of three female founders of uh, Kiri Science, a platform that make young children fall in love with science through play. And uh, I would love to hear more about that, Professor Vartiainen. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start uh, my presentation with short video clip. Should we try it out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So probably as you can guess, my angle to approach our topic today is by approaching how we should introduce science and STEM for young children already at their early years. Uh, at the university, my research is all about uh, studying the pedagogical approaches, how we can inspire young children to uh, to the world of STEM. And I study play-based practices, how we can make children feel that STEM is meaningful for them. And in my research, I also uh, study young children's development of scientific identities. And I'm also one founder of Kides Science and Kides Science put the results of my research into practice. And Kida Science supports uh, teachers of young children all over the world and help them to implement high quality play-based STEM education. But well, that's all about me. I would like to talk about someone way more interesting than me. I would like to talk about a girl, a girl named Helmi. Helmi is eight years old. Helmi is a Finnish girl and she's exactly like all eight year old girls are. She loves animals, she loves swimming. She plays outdoors with her friends, she plays football and she performs TikTok dances in front of the mirror. Can you guess what is the dream job in the future for Helmi? Let me tell you, or wait, no, I won't tell you that. Let's ask straight from Helmi. Helmi, do you mind to come here for a little moment? Say hi to this fantastic audience. Son of hey. Hi. So Helmi, we were wondering here that what is your uh, dream job in the future? Mikä on sun unelma ammatti tulevaisuudessa? Mikä tähän? Olla tutkija. So Helmi said in Finnish that her dream job in the future is to be a scientist. 
Tell me, uh, what do you think, who can be a scientist? Kuka sun mielestä voi olla tutkija? Se kuka vaan haluaa. And Helmi thinks that scientist can be anyone who wants to be a scientist. Uh, Helmi, what do you think, why you are interested in science? Mitä sä ajattelet, miksi sä oot kiinnostunut luonnontieteestä? Kun mä oon saanut tehdä niin paljon kokeita ja tuntee, miltä se tuntuu. And Helmi said that she is interested in science because she has had opportunities to do science experiments and experience how does it feel like to do inquiries. Thank you, Helmi, very much for your help. You can now go back to your place. Sä voit nyt mennä takaisin. Thank you, bye. <laughs> Thanks, bye. So, Helmi there said the magic words. She has become interested in science because she has had opportunities to engage in science activities and STEM activities already when she was about two or three years old. And that is the possibility we should ensure all children all over the world be able to do science, engage in science activities already when they are young. And why is it so important that children uh, should engage in science activities already at their early years? It's because uh, children around ages uh, three or four, they start developing their identities. They start developing the idea of who they are, who am I, what I'm interested in, and what am I good at. And it's highly important that children can have experiences around STEM when they start figuring out of who they are. But when we talk about young children's STEM education, it's very important that we carefully consider uh, the approaches, pedagogical approaches. Uh, in my own research, I have been studying play-based pedagogies, and that's one very effective way to introduce STEM for young children, because play makes STEM meaningful for kids. And by uh, play-based approaches, we make STEM to the size of children. So there is no sense taking children and try to stuck them into the world of STEM. But what we want to do by play is to take STEM and shape it to fit in the children's culture. And as I said, it's crucial that we carefully consider how we introduce STEM to young children, because there is evidence that if we use inappropriate um, learning methods, pedagogical methods with young children, we might even harm children's interest and their feeling of competence. For example, we have research results that shows that even seven years old girls opt out STEM. They feel that STEM is too difficult to me. It's something that doesn't mean anything to me. I feel it's uninteresting. And one thing that is sure is that problem is not in girls. The problem is in us. The problem is in our culture. The problem is the way we talk about STEM. The problem is what kind of role models we show to children. And the problem is the way we teach STEM. So, uh, my mission in my research and in Kide Science work is to help teachers all over the world reconsider how they can introduce STEM to children so that we take into consideration all children's possibilities uh, to develop scientific identities, feeling that I'm good in science and it's something that is meaningful for me. And as I said, because problem is 
in our culture, the way we talk, the way we teach, good news are that we can change that. And that's something we are doing here today. All these powerful, inspiring presentations that we've had and we will have, all we aim to change the ways we talk about STEM and also considering how we change the ways to teach STEM. And let's go back for a moment to Helmi's situation. Will she eventually, when she grow up, will she become a scientist? Well, my opinion is that it really doesn't matter because the only thing that matters has happened already. Helmi, eight years old girl, sees herself as a capable of being scientist one day. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you so much, Jenny and Helmi. Um, that was lovely. And it was also lovely to hear the beautiful Finnish language there. Now, our second last uh, panelist is Ndonium Tunu, who is a climate scientist and a social entrepreneur fighting for climate justice. Um, she's also boasting a long list of awards and recognitions. Uh, she's busy pursuing a PhD in climate change and agriculture, and she is founder and CEO of Black Women in Science, and she's involved in some very fascinating projects. Ndoniem Kunu, the stage is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me, first of all. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes. That was actually on my website. <laughs> so let me actually share my actual presentation. I mean, we had a run through. I shouldn't be having these problems. Um, okay, I'm actually struggling to share my actual presentation. Sorry, everybody, please give me a minute. That's no problem. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Can you also uh, start your video, Ndoni? Okay, yeah, um, I actually did start it. Okay, I don't know why my video's not playing. <laughs> no problem, you can go ahead. Um, okay, let me retry this another way. Sorry, I'm using a MacBook and it just gives me issues here and there. Uh, Ndoni, Eno can also share your presentation if you prefer. Okay, um, are you able to see it now? I think this is better. Yeah. Uh, All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so sorry for that technical thing. <laughs> to be honest, I'm working on two screens and I connected it so it could be all of that stuff. Um, but anyway, my name is Donim Kuno and I am the founder of a nonprofit organization called Black Women in Science. I'm really honored to be here today to present about my NGO and the work that I do and hopefully to spark a great conversation around how do we actually increase and sustain women in the sciences. Um, there is a big conversation that we're not having and into how do we keep people in the system, especially women, and also what are we doing to make sure that they stay in the system? And I think that's the problem that we have. So I found a nonprofit organization, it's called Black Women in Science. Our major focus is to improve the quality of graduates entering the professional, business, and academic sector. And we do this by encouraging Black women to participate in the science and STEM careers. We encourage them to um, apply a multidisciplinary thinking 
<coughs> excuse me, as well as promotes postgraduate qualification amongst young academics. And this is done because there's a concept called the leaking pipeline, meaning that the amount of women, especially black women, coming into the postgraduate qualification level uh, is actually decreased. And if you look in the stats, if you look at institutions like the University of, of um, Cape Town, sorry, UCT, there is only 15 uh, black professors. And when we get into women black professors, we're really talking to really low numbers. So there's a clear need that we need to increase these number of black females in academia and research. And there are many reasons that we should do this um, in diversifying knowledge, in diversifying our solutions, as well as in uh, promoting an equal representation amongst um, science and, and innovation. So as you can see at the bottom, we've partnered with the Department of Science and Innovation, the National Science and Technology Forum, NSTF, as well as NRF, we work with them in mentorship um, on the Women and Girls Day um, and Africa Science Week. And so this is part of our fellowship. This is just, just pictures um, to show you the amount of women that we work with. We have a branch in KZN as well as Durban, um, Durban KZN, sorry, as well as Johannesburg. And the interesting thing now is that due to COVID, we can actually, everything is online and we do everything online and it's an open call. So um, the picture on your bottom left, you can see here that th these are some of the workshops that we host. The picture on your top right, that's the mentorship that we do. And these are our fellows who gave incredible um, presentations around their experience and what they actually wanted to gain in the science community. And so some of the outcomes that we've gained as an organization, um, we have been featured on True Love, two of our fellows. I think she's actually in this call, Dr. Kolelo. I hope she is, if you are, hey. Um, and also Dr. Avele, she's also been a part of our fellowship and they got featured in the True Love magazine and won the award, um, SABC One, um, the Science Star magazine, and a testimony from one of our fellows who said, you know, their scientific, our scientific writing workshop um, assisted her in getting her uh, master's cum laude, um, as well as on SAFM, and as well as the inspiring, um, the, the Mail and Guardian Top 40 Under 40. These are all our fellows really get going out now and being confident in the work that they are doing and media also seeing the role that they are doing. We also have our sustainability projects, and these are just some of the projects that we do, which is on the ground, um, you know, they installed green farming, and we encourage business thinking and entrepreneurship thinking amongst this. So just to summarize it in, in a whole is the work, the organization and the fellowship provides skills and capacity training. We provide science communication, we provide scientific writing, as well as business and entrepreneurship. And why we do this is because we actually did a needs analysis to kind of understand what are the needs and what is the interest amongst these women that we're trying to attract, retain and sustain within the academic field. And these are the skills that they wanted the most. And so I think going forward and the question that we're gonna have as a panel is the question of, are we actually designing our science industry and our science discipline to suit these women? Are we doing enough to retain them? And are we creating programs that's going to interest them and want them to be a part of the science industry? Thank you so much. Ndoni, I love that. Thank you so much, that was great. Um, we need more Ndonis, don't you, don't you agree? Thank you so much. So our last panelist is Judy Sandrock. She is a university lecturer with a background in chemical engineering, amongst many other things. And she has 33 years experience in medium and large corporate environments and NGOs. And she has an international reputation for her involvement with technology and innovation and literally reaching for the stars with her project. Judy, please tell us more. Yeah, let me, um, let me quickly share my slides. And uh, here we go. Um, absolutely. Uh, it seems as if we're all having the, the same challenges. Um, so sorry about this. It's so interesting. Um, by the way, um, I went to uh, I, I went to um, HHJ Primary. 
So uh, for those of you uh, who are in the auditorium, um, yes, uh, I come from the same area. Uh, I come from Highlands North. So um, I think uh, yeah, we, we certainly, uh, we grew up, we've grown up uh, breathing, the, breathing the same air. So, okay, here we go. Let's, uh, let's see if, we c if this will work now. And uh, perfect, here we go. Great. And uh, yeah, so what do I do at the moment? Uh, yeah, I'm a chemical engineering graduate from WITS and uh, I have lectured at a number of universities, mostly on uh, innovation um, in business schools. And uh, I've, over the last number of years, I've been building an organization by the name of FemSTEM. And what do we do in FemSTEM? Um, we, really, uh, we really try to inspire young women to pursue STEM careers um, by delivering inspiring and global space STEM programs. So everything we do, um, our goal is to end up in space. And we have been able to achieve that since 2019. Um, a lot of our experiments have been going to space. And um, also to give young women their first job um, in terms of their STEM career. That was one of the areas where, where I struggled uh, as a young professional was in terms of my early career. Once I was able to get traction in my career, wow, then I could once I proved myself, I could really go, I could go a long way, but uh, it, that, took a, that took a bit of a while. So um, let's have a look here. How exactly do we do that? Um, being a chemical engineer, for me, everything is about process. It's uh, starting with the end in mind and um, what do we want to achieve and how we're going to get there. And so what we do is we have various missions. The first mission always takes place either at school and over the last year, definitely at home. We have kits where you don't need a laboratory. Uh, you don't need a, uh, any lab equipment to be able to build your payload. You can run your experiments and then that same payload can be launched on a rocket into orbit or it can go to the International Space Station. So what we've done is we've taken away all of those barriers to participate. Um, we focus in mission one on Earth in the context of our solar system. Um, a lot of what happens on our planet is because we live on a planet within our solar system. Our, by far our largest energy source is our sun. And um, uh, even, even if we use fossil fuels, those fossil fuels were originally plants that grew because we had the sun. Um, and so we always look at Earth in the context of our solar system. Mission two is where we conduct space camps. We've had a number of space camps for young women in high school. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll share with you in one or two slides exactly what we do there. And then, yeah, our third mission is always in space. I'm either in orbit or suborbital means you're still going into space. You've got an altitude higher than 100 kilometers, which is technically in space but you're not in orbit. So it's a parabola where you go up and down. Um, and then also we run a number of missions on the International Space Station. And uh, yeah, why space? Um, firstly, it's actually the gl fastest growing technical industry in the world is the, the space technology industry. So it's providing a lot of jobs. Um, in Florida, for example, in the USA, where um, most of the launch companies where they launch from, and there's a huge shortage of engineers. Uh, they are, if SpaceX is employing every single last engineer they can, they can get their hands on. So um, it's, a, it's an industry that's just absorbing all the, all the skills that are coming out of universities. So there's a lot of jobs there. And also the thing is that when your technology works in space, it'll work anywhere. It'll work in the maritime industry. It'll work in the air, uh, uh, airplane industry, uh, automotive, medical, anywhere. Um, if it works in space, it works anywhere. And uh, so, yeah, how exactly do we do all of that? Um, so we, what, what happens is that students get a kit at home or otherwise there are kits at school. Um, and we have experiments ranging from, yeah, all of the STEM subjects, including 
the fourth industrial revolution skills. So that is internet of things, big data and machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, we've, uh, we are a, a, a Microsoft, not only a software, but also a hardware partner, education partner. So what we could do is all of our CPUs can run on Microsoft Azure. We can use the Microsoft platform. You don't have to. We run on uh, Amazon Web Services, we run on Google, we run on all the platforms. And also what we do is we'll have a look at data science and research methods. And what we do is we really encourage students to uh, develop their own code. So our kits can be coded in Arduino, MakeCode, Java, Python, MicroPython, all of the popular languages uh, going forward. And uh, yeah, and so space camps, what do we do there? That's where we really get into robotics, autonomy, um, in other words, you know, drones that, that basically fly themselves um, through onboard uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, rovers that, can, that are autonomous. Uh, we do high altitude balloon missions for weather monitoring. Uh, so that's right up, that's through the ozone layer. Uh, so usually an aeroplane uh, will fly, you know, uh, um, a pressurized aeroplane will fly at around 10 kilometers in altitude. Our uh, high altitude balloons are flying at 30 30 kilometers. So that's actually above the ozone layer. So we're able to detect a lot of the ultraviolet light that the ozone layer protects us from um, and all of those sorts of factors, solar radiation that we're being protected from because we have an ozone layer. Now, not only we do we do that, we also have a look at the sustainable development goals. How would we practically implement changes so that we can create a sustainable environment and we can if possible, reverse the, the bad effects that our industrial revolution has, um, has left us with. Um, but we also look at personal leadership, a lot of those soft skills and, and career guidance. I have to say, one of the things that was really challenging for me as a young professional, I, straight out of it, I joined the mining industry and I was one of the very first uh, female engineers in the mining industry in South Africa. And, and I, it was tough for me. Um, I was all alone uh, as, a, as a young woman um, amongst uh, everybody else being uh, men. And um, the thing is that what I did is that I found that uh, I was too easily bullied. Um, I was too easily set aside. Um, men can be very, very aggressive when they climb the corporate ladder. And what I would do is that I would be very polite and I would stand aside and I would let them just charge straight past me even though I was way, a way better engineer. Honestly, the fact that I'm able to build technology and launch it into space as one of the few South African companies or engineers that's actually been able to achieve that. The fact that I've been able to achieve that means that I'm probably a fairly good engineer. But what I was doing is that I was just allowing everybody else just to charge past me. So. What we focus on is also very much the whole person, the, the young woman in the workplace. How do we balance uh, work and life and private life priorities, all of those sorts of things. And also we, we create a lot of friendships and, uh, and a, a support mechanism of like-minded people. So yeah, mission three. So in the center, I for a change, Judy's got a color photo. Um, so in the center is, this is the, um, this is the payload. So it's uh, two layers of X in a box chips. X in a box, by the way, is the technology we've developed that we run everything with. Um, it's uh, used globally, multiple schools, universities, companies use X in a box uh, for, for their satellite payloads. So this is um, two layers of sensors. Um, uh, that you can see there in the middle. And then uh, on the on the right hand side, you can see this is where it's actually been integrated into, into this uh, Faraday cage box, aluminium box um, that that is going to transport it to, to the International Space Station. So yeah, you can see um, we don't like wires. Um, we rather use connectors. Uh, they're a lot more stable and they give us the redundancy we require. So you can see everybody else's payloads full of wires. Uh, we, we don't like wires. Uh, we don't do wires. And um, yeah, so um, if you want to join up, if you want to sign up, there's my email address, js at femstem.co.za. If 
you want to sign up, if you want to sponsor, if you want to donate, or if you just want to participate, uh, please uh, get on board. That payload that you saw over here, it's, um, it's already sitting in California. It's in that box already. It's on its way to space, to the International Space Station in May. So if you want to jump on board, uh, this is the time. And so with that, thank you, everybody. And uh, Alberta, back to you. Man, fascinating, exciting stuff. I wish I could jump on board. Wish I could go to one of those space caps. Um, first, we are going to give our girls in the auditorium an opportunity to come up to the camera and ask your questions. Um, preferably direct your question to a specific panelist, otherwise you can put it to the whole panel. So the girls can start coming up. Um, and I think we have a camera there as well that we can see them. And uh, I'm also asking all the panelists to start your video so that everybody can see the panelists. And uh, yeah, great. And uh, Rafael, if you can also, ah, there's the, there's the auditorium as well. Fantastic. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, my name is, my name is Ayola, and I'd like to please direct the question to Ndoni Mkuno. Yes, go ahead, Ayola. Oh, can I ask the question? Yo. <laughs> uh, um, most of um, the science um, environments are quite masculine, right? Um, construction, like uh, constructions, labs. And so we, we don't feel like we fit into that world. Um, so can I please ask what insights do you have around that issue? Um, hi, thanks for the question. That is incredible. Um, I finally figured out my camera, so which is great. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you look into NASA, right? NASA, I think, you know NASA, the space agency. Um, they couldn't take out their first all-female astronaut team to space because the spacesuits weren't suited for them. And so this happened, I think, in 2019 or 2020 between 2018 and 2020. This just shows you if NASA has not grasped the fact that science is changing and it's one of, it's, it's a leading science um, organization in the world is still struggling to adjust the science to, to women and all of that. How much more other organizations that are still trying to adjust to it? And so I'm not saying that it's not possible. I'm saying that it is possible. It took them about a year to reform and transform um, the spacesuits. And I think they had their first all female space um, crew or astronaut crew go to space last year or the year before, but it's, it's a short space of time. And so this is, should be encouraging for us and it shouldn't be something that makes us feel kind of disheartened. The fact is that I think a lot of these issues have been a blind side because of the lack of us being represented in these kind of fields. And so what we can do is that the more you get into these industries, the more people actually wanna hear. And I think more people are willing to adjust. And so my advice would be, don't be disheartened to get into the sciences based on these challenges, but be aware that once people have become aware, they then change and they adapt and they, and they transform their lives into the industry. And so I would say, push on. And, and once you are in there, be the voice that you need to be to say, hey, what about me? I don't feel safe as a woman, as the only person in the field. And I promise you, people will be willing to listen. Great question and great answer. Thanks so much, you guys. Let's see, who do we have next? Do we have somebody else coming to the camera? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, hello, this is Sumas Judy Sandrock. Um, so my question is um, that the media is largely responsible for um, perpetuating and training gender stereotypes, and they're not going to stop this anytime soon. So how can the policymakers intervene 
um, because this is incredibly undermining the agency and the feminist agenda. So how can like um, women learn? Huh? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, in to summarize the question is um, I'm saying um, how can women have the confidence that she had in your workplace in order to push up and keep on working in an environment that is surrounded by males? Thank you. Great, excellent. Um, what I'm going to do is that I'm also going to support what Ndorni said. Um, a lot of the time what it is is that uh, it's kind of like a vicious cycle because there aren't enough women, um, things don't change. And uh, so what we really need to do is that we need to, we need to have a look at um, the more women we can get into all of these careers, the better. Um, and yeah, you know, the thing is that sometimes one needs to be the pioneer. Sometimes one needs to be the first and we mustn't be scared to be the first. Um, and yeah, it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, you know, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, after I left WITS, I went into the mining industry. And so my, my first job in the mining industry was on a, on a gold uh, reclamation plant. And there was no women's toilet because they'd never had a woman working there before. But what happened? One of the bathrooms was converted. So now we had a woman's toilet, you know. So, so the thing is that it's all of these things that happen gradually. And it's the small victories and it's the small successes we need to focus on. We can't expect an entire industry to transform overnight. The only way anything transforms is in stages. Um, so yeah, we need to be pioneers and not be scared. And I think that that is why it's just so important that we start having these conversations and that we, we make friends. Um, there's also something else that I, that I picked up um, as a female executive in the mining industry, because when I, when I ended my, um, my, my career in industry, I was a senior vice president for, for Anglo-American. So I had a global job. I was, I was pretty senior in the organization. And what I found was that it was also quite lonely at the top as a woman. And one of those, one of the reasons was that as women, we don't stick together. You know, the thing is that um, too often women will be so ambitious that what will happen is that they will pull the ladder up behind them. So instead of lifting other women with them, what they do is that they pull the ladder up. So what I'm really encouraging you to do as young women, as you go into your careers, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that you are a pioneer and you have to lead the wedge of women who are going to come behind you. Don't think you're going to be the only one and don't be that ambitious that you leave everybody else behind. You know, one of the things about being a leader is a leader has followers. So you have to make sure that you are being a leader that people want to follow. And that is actually how we transform a lot of these industries is by, as women, we really, we need to stick together um, because nobody ever can do it on their own. And we just got to make sure that we, we do, that, that we stick together. So I hope that helps a little bit. Dawny, I'm not sure if you want to come in here and also just help uh, answering this question. Sure, I think you I think you you nailed it right in the head. And I think I, I love the point that there's nothing wrong with being the first. It's almost like if we had to go ask Nelson Mandela how frustrating he frustrated he was when he was the first, you know, black president and breaking all these things. And you know, it's just about knowing that and, and it's an unfortunate truth that you just ha have that much of a load that you're not going to be able to come in with a spacesuit already made for you. But the team that raised it were the pioneers and I think that is absolutely okay and we can't expect that while we're trying to transform something we're going to find everything ready a part of transformation is you making people aware what needs to change and I think that's why you just have to be double strong and double confident and it sucks but you know what at the end of the day you are you're changing lives for as many women coming in front of you so yeah thank you Fantastic. Great. Once again, great question, great answers. Thanks, guys. Um, 
Next person to the camera. Uh, we are running a little bit late. Uh, thank you so much for everybody's patience up till now. Um, if you are able to hang around for a few more minutes, that's great. But over to the next next question. So um, with the stereotype that girls don't have the staying power to study beyond a graduate degree, that all we know is to make babies, how can we, um, how can we overcome gender stereotypes as women in the business-related world? This question is directed to the entire panel. Can I ask um, one of our Finnish panelists to maybe uh, start and then um, maybe one or two other comments and, and, and maybe let's keep it, let's keep it short. Yeni, do you want to go? Uh, <clears throat> I, I can go. Well, uh, I think that um, getting women to the uh, in the field of STEM or in any other position where you, your career kind of uh, is, is important to you as well, requires the support of the whole community. In a sense that in Finland, for example, um, our parental leaves are divided very um, in, a, in a very equal way to mothers and fathers. And we have got now even further step to make that even more, uh, even more uh, equal for parents. So it's getting even better than what it was. And I think that involving also men to the family lives is highly highly important and it's priority to make sure that women can have career and they can have children and that is something i think that in finland is very very good situation of course child care kindergarten all kind of systems and that's the social social question and we have to fight to get possibilities for that as well Lovely. Maybe maybe a South African perspective there as well. Somebody want to add something? I'm happy, Albertus, just to comment is, I think, you know, we are in the 21st century and we have to take on these stereotypes very strongly and uh, lead by example as well. So my husband and I are both scientists. We both have very, very busy schedules and we chose to have children. We have three children. And the way we balanced our careers and raising kids is by shared parenting. And I think um, in some of the um, discourse in South Africa, we still stuck on uh, maternity leave and we're not moving to paternity leave. So I think like Jenny said, it, unless we move to shared parenting, and um, you know these days structures of families are changing in terms of same-sex relationships, etc. Gender from a binary is changing, and I think we want to be an inclusive society. We need to take all of this uh, into account, and uh, and and I just am very supportive of a position where it should be a choice. And it shouldn't be something that's frowned upon or looked down within that. And whether you choose or not is your prerogative. It should not be the reason for you to be discriminated against. And I think simply it should be banned from any kind of interview process that they, is about uh, when women particularly are being interviewed, because this is not a question posed by men. And if we're moving to shared parenting, if you're going to keep that question, it should be directed at both men and women. Otherwise, it's called discriminatory. Great. Thank you so much. Um, as we have the next person coming up. Um, yeah. Please go ahead. Um, hello. Um, my name is Sienna Ali. And I have a question for Ms. Jenny. So in our township as females, we are not put into the front line of science, right? So how do we like 
um, navigate our way into this world where we're not put into the mirror way and not given that much recognition as females in the science world. Uh, great. Did you did you put that question to Judy or to Jen uh, to Yenny? Yenny. Um, sorry, so it was for me. Okay, um, can you please uh, say again your main question? I think I there, there was some connection uh, problems and I didn't hear your whole question. So as females, like in my township, right? Um, female future scientists, we are not put into the limelight and the mirror way of being scientists and we're not given the recognition we need. So my question is like, how do we like navigate our way into the science world as females and get, get that recognition we need? Yes, thank you very much. Extremely good question. And um, I, I was talking in my presentation about starting science education, introducing science to girls and boys as well, to children as early as possible so that we can uh, let all kind of kids feel that science is for me. But uh, moreover, we want that we see each other as capable science learners, capable future scientists. So we, we start breaking down the barriers between uh, women and men by starting when kids are still young. So we have equal roles for girl learners and boy learners so that they start, start figuring out scientists as any possible person, no matter what's your gender, no matter what's your background. So that uh, I think it starts from the very root level of how we see each other, how we respect each other. And it's very important that in children's early years, we don't in any way differentiate girls and boys, but we are just people, we are just uh, children learning together. And I think it starts there. Lovely. Maya, you want to jump in as well? Uh, just, just unmute yourself, Maya. Thank you, very, very good question. And I agree with Jenny that you should start as early as possible, but also the feedback from parents, from mothers and grandparents and grandmothers and teachers. I think uh, we should say more good things to, to girls that you, that you are good and encourage uh, also at home, at, at school, more girls to, and if I think myself, I had an excellent teacher at school who always said that, that you are good and you can do it. And also my mother and my parents, they always said that you can study as far as you can. So you have to have a trust on, on home and also, also from school. So make your dream true. I'm sure that you are future makers. Thank you so much, man. I wish we had more time. We, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure there are lots of more questions. Um, I see in the Q&A section, there has been 16 questions already answered. Um, and uh, there are a few more that, that we wanted to get to. Um, maybe, maybe we can just come to that last one um, that uh, Poovan asked um, to Professor Karim, Abdul Karim. Do you think we will be uh, ready should there, heaven forbid, be another pandemic to ready ourselves to be proactive to vaccinate and not be dependent on the rest of the world? So unfortunately, this is an era that we're entering where we will encounter many more uh, pandemics and uh, some may be new and some may be resurgent of existing ones or uh, mutations and changes. And I think with COVID-19, the entire world was not prepared. And, uh, and it's something I think an important lesson to take about how do we invest better 
and uh, and systems and expertise and uh, so on. And a big gap is in bioinformatics and the type of surveillance systems we need that are heavily dependent on monitoring our systems. It's also an era where we need to strike a better balance between the environment and the animals alongside us and people. And I think somebody mentioned industrialization earlier and some of the kind of very, um, very uh, irresponsible utilization of resources and overutilization. So we, we definitely need to pause, think more. And I'm hoping that in Africa, we invest more in knowledge generation. So there's less codependency and that uh, we take on our local challenges as a starting point and the many epidemics that continue to plague us in Africa and that uh, start to create a better balance and more harmonious um, environment and societies where uh, some of these inequities that fuel vulnerabilities um, and, and, and uh, sustain things are actually transformed uh, through knowledge-based economies. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I think what we should do is um, those questions that were asked uh, uh, on, online and um, also those that we didn't get to and maybe if there are more questions in the audience maybe we can record those questions um, and uh, we can ask the panelists to comment on them and then we can send it out to everybody um, so that uh, so that we don't lose out on really really good questions and yeah such a wonderful opportunity to speak to to these human beings that are very inspiring and much smarter than me um, it was really a privilege for me to be part of this and listen to all of you and uh, definitely on a day like today i do not want to have the final word so it's my privilege now to uh, introduce to you the education and science counselor at the embassy of finland in pretoria to say the final words ina soeri uh, let me just see i think i have to make uh, ina a a panelist. Let me just quickly see there. I'm here at the auditorium, I think. Okay, yes. You're there. <laughs> Great. So, um, wow. It just started raining in Johannesburg, but I think it's been raining for us the whole afternoon. It's been raining advice. See, it's been raining knowledge. It has been raining know how. It has been raining inspiration. It has been a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. I wish we could go forever. I wish we could interrogate the fantastic panelists, Karesha, Refilwe, Doni, uh, Judy, Jenny, and Maya for a long, long time. Uh, you have been wonderful. You have been absolutely inspiring. Time is always a problem, but I think each of us, we have taken something today, right, girls? We've taken your advice, we've taken your inspiration. We have admired your example. And as someone of you said, somebody has to be first. You've been the first uh, in South Africa and Finland to show us the importance, what we wanted to discuss today. Girls can do it. Girls, we shine, right? So uh, this is what I want to thank you most with your, you know, wonderful words, your wisdom, your, your courage, everything what you've given to us. I also want to uh, uh, thank the, the wonderful uh, audience today, both online. I, I don't know who you are, but I'm sure you're also uh, uh, people who, who are going to take these lessons forward, who are going to join us in carrying this message forward. I want to thanks, thank the girls at the Waverley uh, Girls High. Uh, you prepared wonderful questions. I think it, it's been a long afternoon for you, but maybe it has given you more energy to continue in your path to, to education and to become the future makers, as uh, Maya said in the beginning. I want to thank uh, the, the excellent team here at Sky Bono. Uh, you made this happen. We were so worried with all this uh, situation around us. Can we really meet in, on, uh, you know, in person? Can we really make this hybrid? 
we've shown that we can make it. So uh, thank you very much for, for Puven, for Cynthia, uh, all uh, for Fee who put the uh, program together, for uh, Enoch and his team who have uh, uh, made this uh, technology possible. And then I want to thank my ambassador, Anne, who has given her full support for the education and science activities at the embassy. As you heard in the beginning, she's a gender champion herself. So you can uh, rest assured that the Embassy of Finland in South Africa will help you to interrogate and discuss these issues forward. And I hope that this will lead to much more uh, uh, interesting events like that. And then I want to thank my colleagues Maseho and Yonna and all the rest. I don't know who I forgot, but give me uh, 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 apologies, except of course, we have Albertus Day. So thank you very much, Albertus. Uh, you have really uh, made this uh, event again, a smooth, uh, you know, uh, a smooth, uh, you are a smooth operator, I must say. Okay, so I think we've taken our time. We've learned so much. Uh, go home safe, stay safe, avoid the rain. And, you know, remember the future is yours. Thank you very much. I didn't want to say the last word, but um, just to let you know that we're going to loop the video and a goodbye to everybody and then we're going to end.